Early in the 20th century, something magical happened. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, built a boat that went nearly twice as fast as all the boats and ships that came before it. It was a boat with wings. He called it a hydrodrome, meaning a machine that flew in water. Today, we simply call them hydrofoils. power is supplied, the foils provide enough lift to raise the hull of the boat completely out of the water, eliminating most of the resistance or drag created by the hull in the water. Like an airplane, the hydrofoil wing is shaped like the wing of a bird, but since water is over 700 times more dense than air, hydrofoil wings can be very small. Hydrofoils are used around the world on high-speed ferries and boats of all kinds. Hydrofoils turn the power of the sea to a ship's advantage. They were originally conceived for high-speed military attack craft. Instead of being beaten by the waves, hydrofoils fly through the calm subsurface of the water. Modern designers utilizing new high-strength materials are putting foils to use on everything from performance water skis to competition sailboats with great effect. Young engineers all over the world are working on new hydrofoil boat designs. In some cases, they are using hydrofoils to make ever more efficient use of human power. Here in Midland, Ontario, the students are working on a new hydrofoil that uses the latest recumbent bicycle design. They've enlisted the help of Jake Free, a pioneer in the design of human-powered hydrofoils. Like airplane wings, hydrofoils provide lift. The key to hydrofoil design is the shape of the foil. The arched top of the wing makes the water above it travel faster than the water below it. This creates lift. As power is applied and speed increases, the lifting action of the foils is transferred through the struts to lift the hull of the boat out of the water. This eliminates the drag of the hull and the bumping effect of the waves. In 1991, engineers at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts built a hydrofoil craft called the Decavitator. It can reach speeds in excess of 34 kilometers per hour using only human power. They currently hold the world record for both the men's and women's solo 100 meter run. Halfway around the world, in Mikabe, Japan, these Yamaha engineers are running time trials on Hamanako Lake. The paddle has been replaced by the pedal and the propeller to make the most out of the limited power available from the human body. Once sufficient power is achieved to lift the vessel onto its foils, hydrofoils stack the physics deck in the rider's favor. This hydrofoil, called the Super Phoenix, ran the 100 meter course in just over 10 seconds. They've hit the record books with a new water speed record for a human powered vehicle. Hydrofoil boats make such an efficient rig that they can be powered to even greater speeds by the sun. This design, called Solan, runs the 100-meter course at over 40 kilometers per hour. The kids at Midland would like to take their water strider for a record run, but first, their dream is to just get it off the ground. It's taken nearly two years of testing and trials to get the water strider to fly. With hard work and perseverance, future innovations could produce a world record-setting machine. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, worked for years on tests and trials of his hydrofoil designs. He dreamed of giant sail-powered hydrofoiling ocean liners that could skim across the Atlantic at record speeds safely and cheaply. By 1919, Bell's work with his partner Casey Baldwin resulted in a world water speed record using an original hydrofoil design, the HD4. At over 70 miles per hour, it was the first really big increase in the speed of boats in at least 4,000. The Bell Museum was built near Bell's Cape Breton home in 1955 by Parks Canada. 
It serves to commemorate the innovations and discoveries of Alexander Graham Bell and is visited yearly by thousands from around the world. The museum retrieved the remains of the HD-4, which had been left on the shore, and it also commissioned construction of a replica of the HD-4, which even used some of the original parts, including one of the original engines. The work of Bell and Baldwin proved that hydrofoil boats were possible and that the speeds they could achieve were unlike anything ever seen before. After World War I, the next steps in hydrofoil development would be made by militaries in Europe, Canada, and the United States. They used a surface-piercing hydrofoil design. This differs from a fully submerged T-foil because its V-shape causes the tips of the foil to come out of the water. A fully submerged T-foil flies just like an airplane wing. But a surface-piercing foil is angled to come out of the water so that it provides progressively less lift as the boat speeds up and lifts from the water. When lift is lost, like when the boat crashes through waves, more of the foil becomes immersed again in water and compensates with more lift. The surface piercing foil continued to be developed and for many years has been the most common type of practical hydrofoil for large vessels because it is more stable than the T-foil. The German Navy worked through World War II to perfect hydrofoils as fast attack boats. Although they were able to achieve speeds up to 41 knots, they came to the conclusion that they were not practical for use in military operations because they could not be used in all sea conditions. It was not until after World War II that the next big leaps in hydrofoil design were realized.